<laughs> Never know what's going on back here until I actually look. Oh, my nightmare uh, during the funeral was the screensaver went on, uh, like the power down went on when I had just a photo of Alice up. I was like, ah, because I had programmed it not to, but for some reason it did. It didn't do it when we had the slideshow video playing, but it did when we had the one photo up. So I, was, I had to keep reaching over and tapping it so it would uh, stay up and not go blue screen on us. And that was just a nightmare scenario. I was like, please don't be a distraction. So it was also a side reason. I wanted to have the video playing then when I, when I spoke, but then it also kept her from going blank behind me. So. Can you pull the, the volume down on the music, please? And then uh, I'm going to hit pause on this. I'll turn my mic on one sec. All right. How are we doing? You guys have any leftover ham or anything? We good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the kids came back. My kids came back uh, on Friday, halfway through the day. So they had been down uh, with Grandma Barb for uh, about seven and a half days. Uh, so they were ready to not get spoiled anymore. Um, <laughs> discipline all the way now. No. So uh, we have the, the only story I have of uh, my kids since they've been back is uh, I was holding Xander on the couch and I think the other two had alienated him uh, at some point. Uh, and it was right before Jody was supposed to get there and help with the bedtime uh, routine, uh, one of our nannies. And I, I just hear silence from the other two in the kitchen. And I'm like, what are you guys doing in there? And I hear oh, just running, uh, which is the universal sign for guilt. And uh, so I get up and I hear Griffey go, we were painting, which is also not a thing you wanted to hear because there's no paint as well. Uh, so they found the butter and we're painting the fridge and a few other things with butter, which has not been a thing that anyone's ever done before, other than in Iowa. They might do that in Iowa, uh, but <laughs> they do sculpting. So, uh, but this was not anything to commemorate any um, teenage Miss Iowa or anything like that. This was, this was just vandalism. <laughs> so uh, all the kids got baths this morning because when you have butter on your hands and your little kids, you touch everything. And we washed it off, but the best you can do is like, it's that ship's already sailed. It's bedtime. Get out of my sight. Uh, just greasy hair this morning for all the kids because they had touched their hair. So it's like Xander had a upon further inspection he actually had a chunk of butter in his hair so he wasn't even the guilty party i don't know what happened there so that was my night how's yours uh, <laughs> so the other thing is uh sarah got new tires on friday and uh we come out and it's like one's flat you're like good so it's like perfect perfect weekend we're doing well uh, <laughs> there's some more gray back here probably if you look closer uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking about different crowds today. Uh, real quick, little ones over to my right. You're you're to my, I'm to your right, so it works out that way. Uh, but little ones to my right. What kind of different crowds have you seen in recent history? Like what's an example of a place you've been that's had a just a crowd of people, different types of people there? Do you go home ever? How many people are in your house? Just do there's like eight. That's a crowd. <laughs> That's a crowd. Your van is a crowd, for goodness sakes. All right. Any other examples of crowds that you've seen or can think of? You ever been to a parade? One of you has? Okay. <laughs> Your parents are vouching that you have. All right. We'll, we'll talk more about this, but there's different kind of crowds that have different purposes. And that's what we're going to be talking about. The crowds that surround Jesus and are involved in Jesus' life. We're going to be talking about that dynamic and what kind of crowd we want to be uh, for Jesus. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but before we get into all of that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together. Thank you for uh, bringing a crowd around this morning. Uh, thank you for what you've done. 
uh, the crowd, the crowd on the first Easter Sunday uh, that uh, came and gathered around a tomb and found that there was no one there. Lord, thank you for uh, the cross. Thank you for an empty tomb. Thank you for uh, the Sundays that have followed, the weeks that have followed, the years that have followed of faithful crowds gathering to witness to your name and what you've done, the reality of who you are, Lord, Savior, and King of all creation. So, Lord, as we gather together, may this crowd glorify your name. We pray in Jesus' name, and we say amen. I'm going to invite the ladies up. We're going to sing two songs to start with, right? Yeah? Gwen's right there. I wouldn't have done this to you if Gwen was not here. I would not have told you if it was not so. All right, please stand as you are able. Uh, please stand as you are able and sing like people who have been rescued. We're going to be 181. Were you there? I think I saw what verse was it? One, two, and four, or one, three, and four? Uh, one, three, and four. One, three, and four. Were you there? Uh, you might think that this is something you should have sung Good Friday and last week, but we still need to think of the cross. It's still true. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> trembling we don't even sing to shout <laughs> so yeah, what a great thing that we can uh realize that he is glorious and he is go ahead i was just thinking about the different crowds that probably were those yeah at those different places that spoiler that alert we might talk about a few right. of those in the scene. <laughs> all right then let's turn to page 176 lead me to calvary we're going to sing verses one and four here Thank you. 
Life live a cross born and a grave empty is the reason we can gather today, even. So greet one another under that reality that you are saved, you are rescued, and there's a risen Savior. Greet one another. Let someone know that you're happy they are here. <laughs> I was putting butter on the three children last night. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Oh, so the like church was full last week. It was. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Keep inviting. Got up to Andrew and Alex, uh, Alex's. There you go. Good morning. 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 Good choice of songs, man. I like, I like the first one. Yep. Yeah. All of it does. All of it does. Especially if I don't do like the traditional. Palm Sunday, and we don't have a good Friday service. Good morning. I don't think he, he must be here, didn't hear. <laughs> must say hi. The structure and, and I mean, he went that, and it was about a week or two before this because he had to cut weight, he had to get down 107 pounds. And he said to mom, I'm so tired and I'm hungry. And, just, and with that attitude, you're not going to do very well. You've got to change your attitude. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and he can. Well, praise God for that. You know, and I, I think, you know, kids, they most don't want to dedicate sometimes and guilt. Yeah, sometimes you have to push through some of those boundaries. All right. Hey, guys. How are we doing? 
right. We got some prayer requests here. Uh, we have a praise report. I don't know if the Bobbins want to share the good news. Well, I'll allow Alan if you want to share or yeah. anyone. All right. I'll get something wrong. Go ahead. Well, we thank you for your prayers because um, I know you guys have been lifting them up. And um, Jen and Elena are doing well. Elena is recovering from her C section. And the twins, um, they're, of course, I think they're beautiful and they're doing lovely. And God just, um, they never had to have help breathing. They're off all of their IVs. They got moved to the second level you know, less care, ICU, so, um, so Eleanor and Solveig are doing very well. All right. Great. There you go. So now you get to pray for them when they get grandma and grandpa duty over weekends <laughs> every now and then. Uh, it's a different thing. Uh, one thing, uh, just a, this isn't part, part of a sermon or anything, uh, a baby Brezza. If you don't have one, look it up. It's a, it's a bottle maker. And you just load the formula you have in there. You program it what temperature you want. You program how many ounces you want. You, you pour water in the back water compartment. 2 a.m., it's a lifesaver, especially with twins. <laughs> with twins, it is a lifesaver. So it's baby Brezza. Uh, so, so look it up. I don't think we still have ours. Otherwise, I totally give it to you guys. Uh, but, yeah, baby Brezza. Uh, there's a, there's a sanitizer thing too. Don't bother with that. It's a waste of your time. You, you're still gonna have to wash everything anyway. It's just wash it well, do everything you well, just do it, do that. But baby Brezzas will save everybody midnight feedings and everything. Um, it's a lot, but like it, oh man, it's good. So that's, that's aside from that, but praise God for, for new heartbeats in this world. So anything else we can be praying for from, uh, any up on Steve, or is he just kind of like on his own now and we keep praying for him? Keep praying. Keep praying. Okay. Well, in an update, my dad has successfully stayed out of uh, the ER this week. Uh, so that's good. Uh, spinal surgery, it's been two weeks as of tomorrow uh, for spinal surgery. So he, he'll be doing okay. He's got feeling back in his legs a lot more than prior to. Uh, surgery, which is good. <laughs> Whenever you have feeling, it's okay. Um, so yeah, we'll keep praying for his recovery. Um, I, there was no news as good news as far as uh, my friend Mike and his family with uh, stomach cancer. The last update was positive for him. I haven't seen anything else. Um, any other prayer requests we can have uh, moving forward from from where we're at? How's everybody in your in your world going? Good. And you had you were babysitting too. She was. She said you'd be so proud of me this morning. I'm sorry, this was, might have been off the record, but you had two overnight. You got showered and we're here on time. Like that's a praise report. That's awesome. Didn't even speed. Hey, <laughs> praise God. All right. Anything else? I'm going to be babysitting mine for a week, starting next, starting Friday. So that's a prayer request. Yeah. <laughs> How old is everybody in that camp? Six and seven. Six and seven. That's a different kind of, yeah. Yeah. Allison's yeah. kind of got some vertigo going on. Second time she's had it, so. And another praise report from Allison. Uh, she asked if we, she could get baptized this summer, uh, possibly around a lake service or big candy sometimes by junior walking across it so we might want to figure out some other way to do it but we'll figure out something but i'm so thrilled that she's made that choice and she wanted to do it with her church family uh present so we'll figure out something um even if we have to have a fire truck and a hose from a distance or something <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get it done we'll get it done uh, no no change my mind <laughs> We do immersion. I, no. <laughs> no, we'll be we'll be good. We'll be good. I uh, promise not to use a fire truck. All right. Well, that's the praise, but we're also we'll also pray for her now. So, anything else we can pray for? I, I'm just there's a, a little girl that I work with. Is I, I I won't divulge her name, but her home situation is not very good. So I've done many things for her, and it's really just a real a very need because 
of what the family has said that she's not to say anything to her teacher or myself or others and of what's happening at home and it's not a good situation it's just yeah. prayer for her safety absolutely i guess i would say that we'll pray for, for, her. for her care we'll pray for her and all the <laughs> kids that need love and and safety yes I had an interview this Wednesday as a social worker at my high school. Ooh. Yeah, we'll pray for that. Absolutely, those high schoolers—they need, <laughs> they need it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, on this day that. Uh, we, we take communion uh, later today. Uh, we thank you for uh, the gift of a loving father, sending a loving son uh, to show us the sacrificial love uh, that is on display, that is offered. Uh, Lord, we ask that we see your love, your beauty, and your sacrifice. Uh, Lord, we have so much to be thankful for this morning, first for that, but also for uh news of people getting healthier and, and healing. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for those, those things. We thank you for uh, grandchildren who are healthy and here now. We thank you uh, for choices to uh, make an outward expression of an inward change of wanting to get baptized. We thank you for all these things. We thank you for job interviews and the perspective hope uh, that that offers. We thank you for um, just in some cases, silence when it comes to updates so that there's there's no bad news. It's just regular life, some normalcy. Lord, we thank you for those things. But we also ask you for, for things this morning. We ask you for favor in interviews. We ask you for little kids who need love and protection and safety. Lord, help them to see that you are a loving father, even though home life might be tough, even though uh, social life might be tough, even though Things might be hard and life might not be fair. Uh, Lord, we ask you to be with uh, the little children. Lord, we ask you to be with Allison as she's had another episode of vertigo. Give her uh, just health and give her confidence that you are with her and comfort that you are with her. Lord, we pray for Kelly Erickson and any testing that she has to do, any, uh, any opinions she seeks, any treatment she needs to do. Uh, Lord, we ask you that you are with her and that she realizes that and she can feel the, the warmth of your embrace on her life. Lord, we pray for um, just grandparents as they have to babysit grandchildren, uh, whether it's uh, in the near future or somewhere down the road. Uh, let, let, let the home life of family life extend beyond just the four walls in, in, in the nuclear family onto the extended family. Lord, we pray for those who, I uh, pray for my own life as uh, we blend families. Our little kids get together and realize how loved they are and that they can love one another actually too. Uh, Lord, continue to walk in our lives. Continue to utilize us uh, as we mourn with those who mourn. We give you thanks uh, for crowds gathering together to uh, remember lives and tell stories of lives. But we also uh, ask you to be with us on hard anniversaries as they approach. Lord, there's so many people that have been impacted by loss. Uh, Lord, we know you are near the brokenhearted. Help mend our hearts. Uh, Lord, help us to help us, those of us who might be in a very good spot, help break our hearts for what breaks yours. Help us to rejoice in the things that cause you joy and help us to see the good in our lives and the glory that you deserve as we go to you in worship this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How are we doing? Doing all right? So far, so good. Well, got a question for you guys. I already talked to the kids about this. What are some of the crowds in your lives lately that you've either seen or can think of? Basketball. Basketball. Ding, ding, ding. All right. Basketball. Anything else? School or work. All right. Anything else? Funeral. Thank you. I was going to try to touch on that one, but yeah. Anything else? Crowded restaurants. Crowded restaurants. Yeah, there's there's different things. 
you got the 4th of July could be your crowd. You got parades, you have fireworks. You go to Spicer on the 4th of July, that, that little lake community goes from a, like, it's listed like 1,100 on the sign, but on a weekend 4th of July with good weather, there's been 30,000 people there. You know, it, it gets pretty crazy. Uh, you've had you've had people over for Christmas. We have Christmas service. We have we have Christmas celebrations with our families. We have Thanksgiving meals where where you're definitely not cooking for two, three, or four anymore for the most part, right? Or or if you're not, you're you're attending a place that's not cooking for two, three, or four. All right. Uh, there's weddings that you've been to or are planning, right? Or uh, I just put this up, this protest, there's different kind of crowds. And the reason I include this is not some political statement or anything. It's the reality. It's a different kind of crowd, right? And so when you start thinking about the crowds around Jesus's life, there's going to be different dynamics of different crowds. And they're out for different purposes. And so the purpose of our crowd here today is to explore Jesus and to draw closer to Jesus. And then to go out and tell the other crowds that might not know Jesus about Jesus. And even better to do it, hopefully more accurately, and with with uh, sincerity of a life changed, right? So that's just what I was thinking about as we're going into this. There's different crowds and different things. So let's go to our scripture. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in your pews, most likely. It's that red book. Otherwise, on the back of the bulletin, there's the main scripture for today. We're going to be in Mark three, starting verse seven. We'll be in a bunch of other places, uh, but. Yeah, just if you need a Bible, we'll give you one. Uh, hit me up after, after the service, and I will find one that you want and that you can make your own. The best Bible, the best translation of a Bible is the one you're willing to read. All right? So that's where we're going with this. Starting off, verse 7, chapter 3 of Mark. Let's may God bless the reading of his word. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. You see that? Large crowd. Huh. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God, but he gave them strict orders not to tell others about them. We're going to pause here really quick, really quick. Just put a finger in that spot. It's not that hard to find it again, I guess. You're, you're, yeah, unless you're crinkling pages, you're okay. All right. Is anyone really worshiping yet in Mark's account of Jesus, the introduction of Jesus? No, no. There's very little worship happening yet, right? Everybody's kind of getting introduced to Jesus's public ministry, and there's not a lot of worship going on. Is anyone acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God yet? The demons. We've had two instances of that, and way back in chapter one, you're going to see John the Baptist. Other than that, you don't really have a lot of people acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God, all right, which is a really interesting dynamic. But there's still crowds gathering. They're curious, and what they want is might be a little bit different. Uh, so what, he's do, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to silence the impure spirits. Why would someone do that? The only things acknowledging you for who you are are impure. Why would you silence them, do you think? This is this is just a hypothesis, but I think it's pretty accurate. Why would you do that? Does Satan quote scripture? When Jesus is in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan, he, he quotes scripture, but what's he do with it? He twists it. All right, so if an impure spirit with impure motives is occupying someone here, I don't know how that necessarily always works or what it looks like. It just says what it says. Do you think they're going to have an accurate depiction of Jesus if they go out and talk, start telling people about Jesus? Probably not. That would be my best guess here. It doesn't say that. That's my best guess. So he's silencing them. The other thing is Jesus works on Jesus' time. All right, if it's not time for him to be discussed like that yet, it's not time. So representation and the timing of it all, that's my best guess of it all. Uh, but like, once again, Satan quotes scripture. And we don't want him, we wouldn't want him in the pulpit. All right. So you see, certainly see people who want healing. That's the crowd gathering around Jesus. 
and you see pushback from religious people. That's another crowd around Jesus. But so far, we don't really see anyone adoring Jesus. And church, let that be a wake-up call to us and be on the, at least in the back of our minds as we go into the sermon today. We don't see anyone worshiping God. We just see crowds. Let's get back to the text. Verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to them those he wanted, and, he, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These were the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name, yeah, whatever. It means sons of thunder. You didn't know how to pronounce it either. All right. Which uh, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealous, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And that's what we're going to be talking about. That's a different crowd. That's a, that's a more intimate circle. That's the crowd Jesus is teaching with intentionality to go and be sent out. And, and so we're going to look at the different kind of crowds. We've already discussed the kind of crowds we saw. We went through the slides already. Uh, the kids answered a few. Uh, the, the bigger kids answered a few. There's different kind of crowds, and they all serve different purposes. And business is going to really start to pick up amongst these crowds in Jesus' life. The passage here is a little bit of a transition to where we've been talking about the introduction of Jesus. If all you had was the Gospel of Mark, if all you had was this letter that Mark wrote depicting Jesus, people are starting to fade off. People who have been eyewitnesses of Jesus are starting to pass away. And so some of the people closest to Jesus are starting to write down their accounts and pass it on to have accurate depictions going forward about who this Jesus was. So you didn't have some wild account of, yeah, he flew around. Like, no, that's not what Jesus did. No, he drove a car. No, that's also not what Jesus did. You know, he he looked, he had paler skin than I did. Probably not. You know, like there's there's going to be inaccurate accounts of Jesus spring up. So they were going out and they were writing down accounts of what actually happened. And so what we're going to see here is this introduction of Jesus. And it's going to start transitioning into the teaching and the ministry of Jesus. And as we see this, the crowds are going to start to form sides. And you're going to see the intentionality of Jesus with the crowds and the intentionality of the crowds towards Jesus. But in any event, the word is out. You start healing people who can't be healed, it gets out, right? You, you start doing things that medicine couldn't do, word gets out, right? We talked about a praise report uh, from a caring bridge report that we texted out uh, about a week and a half ago where uh, Mike's, one of Mike's physicians was like, I wish I could claim credit for this, but I can't. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that they're pointing towards Jesus, but I would point towards Jesus in that scenario. That prayer is helping. So the towns, another kind of crowd, these towns that are listed in this passage are from every direction if you were to look at them on the map. Word is starting to spread. The small little movement, starting with this one man, is starting to spread. This God become man is starting to spread out. The healing is starting to spread. The, the word about that healing is starting to spread. It's going in all directions, and all directions are converging on Jesus. There's curiosity at the very least. There's opposition to Jesus, but he's delivering results with his authority and his teaching and his healing. So there are crowds forming. But so far, everyone's just kind of coming out to meet their needs. And, and I would say this. If I were sick or if I were desperate, I would want to do the same thing. Right? Right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, I have a knee that is flaring up right now with arthritis. That's about a 6 out of 10 just sitting here. Right? When, if at the end of the service, when I, when I straighten up or when I go to do this communion and get out of the way, I actually have to manually move my leg a little bit just to help start that process. Right? Like I'm going to Jesus with this. Right? But the point is, bigger point is this. We have to go to more Jesus for more than our, just our needs. Otherwise, we run the risk of treating him like a genie a lifeguard that we only go to in case of emergency, a genie that we only treat like we just have wishes, or we don't go to him at all eventually once we get something healed or once we get what we wanted. 
and there's an idolatry that happens. So this, this crowd, there's a hint of instant gratification in these crowds because what happens after they get healed? They go home. They don't stick around and worship. They want the healing more than they want Jesus. And we pray for all the healing all the time, and we want that. So don't stop. But let's keep building on that. Let Jesus keep building on that relationship. The risk when we only go to Jesus with well, what we want or what we perceive we need is we turn that relationship into a transactional relationship. All right? Or we don't see that if it takes time, sometimes the answer to some of our prayers is no or wait or, or something similar. We go, oh, it didn't work. And we go away. That's a risk. And in the long term, in the longest term, in the eternal sense of things, that's our only hope we just walked away from because it didn't work that one time in our eyes, our limited view. We look at eternity through a straw hole. We look at eternity through a straw hole. We don't get the big picture. And unless we pull that away and start to see the fullness of Jesus, we're going to miss a lot of what Jesus has to offer. He's not just offering salvation. He's offering a way of life. He's offering a change to how we live. So if we're not careful, our first approach to Jesus is actually going to end up looking a lot like ourselves. We're looking in a mirror when we look at Jesus that way, when we do that. And we're not looking at uh, being made in his image. What we run the risk of is making him in our image. And that Jesus is powerless to save. That Jesus is powerless to change your life when he is made in our image. But when we allow him to construct our lives, to make us in his image, because that's how we are constructed and that's the way it's designed, then we go to him. He goes, I will fix that. I will heal that. And we'll see some of his purpose. We'll see some of what he's doing. And we might not always understand it, but you have a better opportunity to do that. But when we approach Jesus, looking at him just as like almost like ourselves, like here's what I would do in this situation, or just as an advisor, or as a genie, or as a lifeguard, we miss Jesus, and we make him in our image, and we're going to fall short of the opportunities and the beauty of knowing Jesus. We run the risk of not actually knowing Jesus, or not knowing him to the extent we could. It's a changing faith. I, I bring this up every now and then. You ever look back, uh, say like five years ago, on your life and go like, huh, should have done that differently. Or, man, that was dumb. You might experience this more in your 20s looking back in your teens or even like your 30s looking back in your 20s. Uh, maybe not as drastic, hopefully not as drastic as you got older and have been walking with God longer. But have you ever looked at yourself five years ago and were like, I'm glad I'm not that person anymore? Just just me. I got some nods, so I'll take that. Thank you, him. <laughs> I would venture that like all of us have that and it's a good thing to have that little twang of just like not quite remorse, not quite regret, but almost like embarrassment too. I don't, it's like a hybrid emotion of just like, I can't believe I used to think that I have it all the time. And they give me a face mic and, and like, I get to be here on Sunday mornings. So Jesus isn't looking for your perfection. He's looking to change you into who he is. And there's going to be one day where you are made new. But that's not going to happen on this side of eternity. But he will change you. And you'll see it. If you look back five years, odds are you'll probably see and have an opportunity for a prayer of gratitude. There's power in knowing Jesus. There's hope in knowing Jesus. I'm a better father because I know Jesus. I will be a better husband because I know Jesus. And he offers healing and salvation, but he offers, also offers a way to live. And we cannot ignore that dynamic. If you have a relationship with Jesus that does not change you, I would challenge you to look deeper into who Jesus is and allow him into more of your life. In John 6, I'm going to try to figure this out because it's such a huge chunk of text. I'm going to, do, I'm going to be dangerous here and play with technology on the fly because it's going to be a little harder to read for you guys, so I apologize. Uh, but we're going to pick it up, verse 28, just to catch you up on where we're at in the text. Uh, John 6, Jesus feeds 5,000. He walks on water. He does a few other miracles. And then he gets into this conversation. And we're going to pick it up. Uh, they said to him, 
What must we do considering concerning the works of God? Jesus answered him, this is the works of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. All right. He wasn't like, hey, go out and feed the hungry, although he wants you to do that. Go out and love those who are sick. Visit the prisoner. He doesn't say that. He doesn't give them a laundry list of to-dos. He says, believe. When you believe, it's going to change your to-dos. All right? He just says, believe in the one who is sent. When you're in a law-based culture, which is what they were under, do this, don't do this. This is the law of Moses. It says, do this, don't do that. And then when you're in a law-based culture, which we're currently in, we talk about this all the time. This is the ESV translation. So if you're looking along at home, uh, just if it doesn't quite jive with your NIVs, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so it, we, we talk about law and order special victims unit. We have like 400 law and orders. We're, we're still a legalistic culture, right? We love when the bad guy gets what they deserve in our eyes. We don't, the, the movie industry would fail if the bad guy just got forgiveness every time, right? So the movie industry is not how Jesus lines things up. Right. And so when we look at this, they're asking, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And Jesus goes, believe. And it's going to conflict with a lot of our natural instinct to go, to go like, that's it. But then when you start thinking about, man, that's a harder thing. I need a lot more grace to believe than, than just me doing it on my own, don't I? Oh, belief is a gift from the Lord. Faith is a gift from the Lord as well. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talks about that. But in John 6, they keep this conversation going. So they said to them, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? He just fed 5,000 with a Lunchable, right? He just walked on water. He's been healing people left and right to this point. What more can the guy do? Let this be a lesson to us that if we keep moving the goalposts on Jesus, we're considering ourselves God and not Jesus God. We are playing that role actively. It, it would be so much easier if he was here. We talked about this last few weeks, if he was here. They have Jesus here. They've seen him feed all those people. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him heal those people. And they're like, yeah, but what else? If you're in a relationship like that, get out, by the way. Like, that's an unhealthy relationship. <laughs> Like, that's free advice for your future dating lives. If you're in a relationship where they're looking, what else can you do for me? Get out. All right? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. They gave him bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses that gave you this bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. So he's transitioning. He's using the reference point. They're, they're talking about, oh, when God provided through Moses then. And Jesus is going like, yeah, he's providing through me now. Is that transition point in this teaching he's giving them. For bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Then Jesus declared, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So just seeing Jesus, just having physical Jesus in front of you would not be enough to change our hearts. You might go, it might help. Well, maybe. But the outward, the outward doesn't matter as much as what's going on inside. He's here to change inside. He has the Holy Spirit that changes your inside. We have evidence in the Bible. We have evidence in our daily lives. We have evidence of prayer answered. We have evidence all around us. Romans 1 talks about all of creation cries out to the glory of God so that man is without excuse. There is reason to believe that God is who he says he is. And there's reason to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. There's proof. We pray for opened eyes and softened hearts to believe that. Be part of that crowd. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Do you see that? If you come to Jesus, he will not cast you out. So some of us might be like, you might feel that twinge of guilt. Like I was a knucklehead five years ago. You don't know how big a knucklehead, Jeff. You have no idea how big a knucklehead I was. You have no idea how far I went. You have no idea the bad I've done. You have no idea. And you're right. I probably don't. But you know who does who you're not surprising? Jesus isn't going to come like, you're not going to pray to Jesus. And he'll, he was not going to, Ugh! you know, he's, he's not going to be like, oh, I changed my mind. 
He's not going to cast you away. The whole reason we have a cross is because of the knucklehead stuff we've done. This was before you ever sinned once. An empty tomb was before you ever sinned once. It was before you ever repented once too. This is everlasting. There's no expiration date on that. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Not only is it Jesus' heart to do this, it's his Father's heart to send his Son. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me by raising up on that last day. When Jesus raises up on that last day, you are risen up with him. You share in his death, you share in his resurrection. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life that will raise him up on that last day. So, so we're going to pause it right there really quick. Actually, let's keep going, actually. 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father uh, and mother we know? How, can, how does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Reasonable question. If, if you saw a baby, you, you saw babies like that, that came from Mary. That's a reasonable question. But what's unreasonable about it is he's doing all these things and proving all these things. He's teaching with a different kind of authority. Everybody's acknowledging this. He's different. You can tell he's set apart. There's just something different about this person. There's something different about him. And so they're starting to grumble. And they're pulling the card of like, if, if someone makes it big here, like, like, let's say, Garrett, you're new, so I'll pick on you. Garrett, you, you enter into American Idol, and you're like, you have the voice of an angel suddenly. Do you? No? <laughs> Not yet. All right, so we'll pray for that. So you enter into American Idol, and all of a sudden, you wow everybody, and you win it. And we'd be like, man, that's Garrett from down the block, man. He came to church here once. How could, how could that dude win American Idol? I heard him when he was warming up, and his range is car to shower, and now he's singing like an angel. What is going on? And this is what's kind of happening there. They took familiarity and comfort with what they knew and were not willing to accept the things of God that they couldn't understand and wrap their heads around. And so this was a stumbling block for people who had heard about God but didn't really know God and didn't pay attention to what God was doing. Garrett, if you ever sit up closer, you're going to be made an example of more. Kathy gets it every week, so I started at the back. I'm changing it this week. I'm starting from the back and moving forward. So just, just a heads up, everybody. We're going to get these front pews filled yet. So they start grumbling. So we miss that if we're only coming to Jesus when we're desperate for temporary healings, we then start to fade away with the crowd that fades away once they get what they actually wanted. And that's a tragedy. I tell you guys this all the time. I tell this, I tell this to youth groups when I guest speak at youth groups all the time. You guys are in a dangerous position because what happens sometimes is we get inoculated to the ways of Jesus if we're just showing up because we show up. If we're not showing up with intentionality to hear the word of God, if we're not showing up with intentionality to join in with the saints, if we're just singing songs, you can do that in the car ride home. However, but if we're here to worship, if we're here to fellowship, if we're here to encourage one another, there's something different about that. Jesus has constantly proven himself. And there's this element of faith in following Jesus. If we were omniscient, if we knew everything, we wouldn't need a Savior. right? If we were omnipotent, we'd be all-powerful. We wouldn't need a Savior. If we were Jesus, we wouldn't need a Savior. But the fact is, by our nature, we have sin. And so we need a Jesus. And so if we keep moving the goalposts, looking, not looking to Jesus as Savior and, and as Lord, and instead limiting him to a good teacher, which he can't be if he's actually Savior and Lord. If he's not actually Savior and Lord, he can't be a good teacher. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Anyone claiming to be Savior, if he's not, he's not a good teacher. Right? If we just limit him to a good teacher or as a philosopher or anything less than that, we miss him as a beautiful Savior. So this exchange continues in verse 43. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Isn't that kind of a relief? If it was up to my choice, I might choose anything else. But just the fact that I'm considering this, that if you're wrestling with this today, like, I don't know where I even stand here. God has drawn you to this point. 
And that's good. That's okay. If you had everything together and like, come follow me, I would have some doubts. But if you're wrestling with this on any level, that's good. If you have confidence in it, that's awesome too. Praise God for that because he has brought you to that point. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he was from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread of life, the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. That's a tough teaching. <laughs> How many of you guys would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm out uh, if you keep talking like this uh, here. We're about to take communion. We're literally about to do what Jesus forecasted was going to happen. The Jews began to argue. I'm going to ditch this because it's easier for me to hit my notes uh, on, on this. So I apologize in advance for trying to figure out technology here again. We'll get there. There. There we go. So he just tells them, this is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're kind of missing the point. They're missing the point of a sacrifice. They're missing a point. This is tricky stuff if you're not actually listening to Jesus and you're just there for his stuff. Right? If you're just showing up on Sundays and you hear that and it's your first time experiencing it, man, thank God that you're experiencing it now. But man, there's so much more to it that led to this point. So don't give up on it if this is a tough teaching. So Jesus goes, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and son of man and drink his blood, you have no life. He's just fed 5,000 with fish and loaves, much more traditional food, right? And now he's getting into complex teaching here. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. If you notice anything about that location, that's his hometown now. That's where he's living. All right? He's living in a room in Peter's house at this point. And so he's just one of the guys. He's one of the town folk. If we're in if we're in Olivia and something like this happens, they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's Jesse from down the street. How could this be? So it's throwing some people for a loop here. At this, though, what happens to that crowd that's hearing them teach like this? They start to leave. They start to leave. They wanted the stuff. They go, they essentially had said, Right before all this, hey, can you keep doing this? Can you keep providing the bread? Can you keep providing the healing? Can you keep providing like you just did there? We saw you feed the 5,000. Can you keep doing that? Can you be our vending machine? The parade, the crowd started going the wrong way. They started drifting from Jesus like, nah, I'm out. Once he started about talking about how salvation works. And the crowd left. And my, my warning to us all is... Don't follow the wrong crowd. Don't follow a mob. We just came off of Easter Sunday. How do you get a risen Savior? You have to kill him first, right? He lays down his life. This crowd shout, shout, chanting Hosanna on Sunday was chanting crucify him Thursday and Friday. The crowd mocking him. The crowd mocking him while he was hanging on the cross left once the show was over. The carnival left town. When this tomb is there, who, who are the only ones going? The women were the first witnesses. They come back. And then John and Peter race to the tomb and find the same thing that was testified about. And they come back and testify to their crowd that was hiding. So how do we become more than just a part of the crowd. 
Jesus talked about his main point. The main reason he came was to teach. The main reason he came was to teach. Teach about who, what heaven is like and who his father is and what he's like and how to connect us. So how do we prevent ourselves from treating Jesus like a really awesome vending machine or a benevolent genie? How do we keep from treating him like a cosmic lifeguard? How do we keep from falling in that same crowd? Or how do we keep from becoming part of the crowd that goes, just forget about that, crucify him, he's done. How do we prevent ourselves from being that? He's able and he's willing to heal and save, but he's this intimate Savior who dwells in us and longs for us to dwell in him. There's a depth and intimacy that we are called to, both corporately, as a group, and individually, intimately, one-on-one. -on -one. That if we're not careful, we just drift along with whatever comes along and wherever the wind blows. Or the next really cool idea. Eventually, the big crowd goes home, and we're left with a slightly different scene. So in our text today, we're left with a slightly different scene. Eventually, that crowd goes home, too. And he's left with, like, about 12, we'll say. Right? They name 12. There might have been a few more people around that group, but he, he names 12 to follow. He goes up on this mountainside. Whenever he goes up on the mountainside, he's either teaching or he's withdrawing. And here he's allowing people to withdraw with him. Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to them, to call to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and they might send them out to preach and have authority and to drive out demons. In his crew, are there any perfect souls? He lifts off all that crew. But I can tell you right now, you're going to be like, no, nah, yeah, that's 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 a no-go. Are there is there anyone perfect in his crowd? Is there anyone perfect here? Even if you're married, the safe answer here is no. All right. <laughs> no, nah, baby, he didn't mean you. No, yeah, I mean you too, baby. Yeah, so there's no perfect souls. There's no one coming along and just absolutely nailing it. Some are going to get rebuked pretty sternly. And in our lives, we feel that sometimes too. like, oh, man, I messed this up pretty badly. And others constantly need reminders. You guys ever need a reminder? We're here every Sunday. And if you don't think you need one, we're here every Sunday. I'll remind you. Doug will remind you next Sunday. One in his crowd is even going to betray him. It says explicitly right there. Huh. But what do they all have in common? They were chosen by Jesus. They were loved by Jesus. They were served by Jesus. And they even broke bread with Jesus. The crowd yelled, Hosanna. Judas betrayed him. The crowd yelled to crucify him. The crowd mocked him. And that crowd disappeared. They are all loved by Jesus still. That's why he took the cross. After resurrection, though, something happened. A crowd of witnesses started forming, and nothing could change their mind. In Romans, it says it this way. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation was able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our, our Lord or his people. Just reading that now, the tagline, that little tag after the comma, or his people. Nothing separates you. So some of us, some of us know people that have struggled with like, oh, how do I come back to church? It's been so long. I feel judged if I go there. Do you see what just happened here? Nothing can separate us from the love of God or his people. We get to represent the love of God to other people that might not understand that that's a reality that they can have to be that kind of crowd. That's all working together for the good of those who love him, for his glory and for our good. It's a people with a purpose, a body that loves the Lord and encourages one another. In Hebrews 10, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way that opened for us through the curtain, that curtain tore from top to bottom, by the way, a way we couldn't reach, tore from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified, when he died. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let's draw near to God with a sincere heart and full with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let's consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. The crowd. Okay. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now I'm saying this. Just do it in everyday life. All right? 
there's an event happening in the near future. There's this eclipse coming. And I've seen a lot of really weird stuff going like, hey, man, we had an earthquake and there's an eclipse coming. What do you think? Stop it. All right. If you're one of those people, I apologize. But stop it for real. Like earthquakes happen. Eclipses are planned out hundreds of years in advance. You can forecast these things. It's not going to be the end of the world. But we pray that Jesus comes soon. All right. We're not scared of those things. But we also don't see a demon behind every tree. Okay. We are called to be the people. We are called to be the people who know that Jesus is for us and not against us. And that can remind other crowds outside of this one here Sunday mornings that Jesus is for them and not against them too. And if people turn towards them, they don't have to sprint across a minefield to find Jesus. Jesus is right there waiting. He is lifted up high. And there will be a day when he lifts us up high too. That he is part, uh, he's the leader of a crowd that's, Echo is love, and that song is salvation, and that we can be part of that for all eternity. We know God because of Jesus, and other people can know God because we know who Jesus is, too. Let's be a part of that crowd. Let's, let's pray. Then we're going to do communion, and then we're going to close off with our final song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for Jesus drawing crowds. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a part of this crowd. Lord, help our hearts look more like yours. Help our hearts be more for those who don't know you. And let our crowd never, ever feel like a mob. Let, let our crowd war against this world, not with missiles, not with judgment, but, but with missionaries and by showing it what it is not in loving ways that are sweet to their souls. Lord, help us to be more like you. Help us to look more like you. Help us to love more like you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And the crowd says, amen. All right, I'm going to invite Gwen up to, can you play some music while we do? Uh, sorry, this was not in our schedule. Um, we're going to do communion. And uh, part of how we do communion, if, you, if you're newer here or visiting here, is we're going to do the bread first, and then after everybody's been served the bread, we take it together. Unity, part of that communion, that uni union part of it. Part of that community part of it. So we're going to remember what Jesus did on the cross. And then we're going to do the same with this crowd's going to drink uh, the grape juice in this case uh, to remember what Jesus shed on the cross. So it's part of this community, part of this crowd declaring that, yes, I believe that Jesus took the cross for me. Yes, I believe he suffered and died. But, yes, I believe he rose. And so that's how we remember this. So I'm going to do my best with a little bit of a hobble to go around. And I will distribute bread this one. Please take, if you believe this to be true. letter, one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians, uh, he's writing to a church that didn't really get it and needed a reminder of why they were taking communion. 
And he says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So right now, we're going to take the bread and in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, we take and eat. Once again, he's he's writing to this church in Corinth, and it's a church that wasn't getting it. And I just think about, if you think about who's writing to this church, it, it's Paul, who used to go by Saul until he had this encounter with the risen Christ and, and just had the power of, love, of Christ change his life, total 180. He was on his way to persecute churches, people claiming Christ, these, these new Christians these, these, these people representing this new offshoot of Judy, he was like, I am, th this has got to stop. His life had been changed so much that he's all in, so all in by a risen Savior. And he's writing this church, he goes, in the same way he also took the cup and after supper, saying this is a cup of new covenant in my blood, do this. And as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we take this as a group, as we take this as a community, as we take this as a church body, we proclaim his death, but we proclaim his resurrection. It's a reminder to our hearts to go remind all the other hearts out there of the reality of Jesus. You may take and you may drink. I'm not sure if anyone's going to collect the cups, but if you're wondering what to do with it, there is a trash bag, uh, trash basket right there. Otherwise, uh, there's also uh, one thing I've been lousy at doing. We do have an offering plate back there. Uh, it's not prerequisite for you to attend this church to put anything in it. Oh, no, just I literally want the, the garbage basket. Sorry. Yeah, you don't have to do that. That's why. That's why. But there's an offering basket there, too. I do a lousy job of we don't really take an offering here other than just whatever happens back there. Uh, so you're welcome to, to give as you feel blessed to do. Uh, but for now, we're going to close off by singing 438, Cleanse Me. I'll let the ladies leave from here. Good thing all four birds are can stand if you're able. <clears throat> Oh,
for just a little bit it made me laugh because god god changes it's okay they, they can come through if they need to uh, uh god changes our heart and there's there's times where i just kind of giggle like the, the line in here like replacing me the fire uh that burns with any talks about like the difference between a fire that burns with uh just like faith or a fire that burns with shame there's a huge difference and i was just thinking about like there's there's a sensation I get, and this is going to sound so stupid. Uh, when I'm driving, and all of a sudden I'm like, "Oh man, that light's yellow," and I'm like, "Oh, I, I feel it. I feel this tingle in me for some reason." I'm just like, "Oh, sorry, that's going to be red before I get through." Oh gosh, you know, I feel this tingle in me. It's like it's this this burn of slight shame. I know it's a silly little example. I know I, I'm not that way in anywhere else in my life. It, it feels like I need to repent on so many other things. But the reality is, man, there's a difference to have freedom and forgiveness and to be able to trust God that he is enough to take away that feeling of the more serious things than just running a yellow or maybe a stale yellow that might have turned red, right? So, like, there, there's more important things that he will handle and he will take if you let him. So go be a free people, free from your sin free from your shame and free from condemnation because God, because Jesus himself said he will not turn away anyone who comes to him. Go and tell the world what they need to hear. God bless you guys. Hey, bud. Hey, thanks for joining us.